Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Reclaim Your Vote, uh, <laughs> Justice Now, but the Reclaim Your Vote edition. We will get started shortly. Hey, Alex, how are you? Hey, Jerrica, how's it going? Um, it's going great. I'm looking forward to today's conversation um, and our amazing leaders. I know we have Tiffany Lofton and Christine Chen joining us shortly. So, oh, I think Tiffany's finding her way in. There she is. Hey, hey, Tiffany, how are you? I'm good, family. How are y'all? Y'all look good. <laughs> it's good to see you. Likewise, good to be seen. Yes, yes. So we Sorry. were just talking about how excited we are for this conversation. We're letting some more folks roll in, uh, roll onto the IG Live. Um, and we have one other amazing leader joining us today, Christine Chen. So we will keep an eye out for her. Okay, Ghana's in the building. Hey, Ghana. <laughs> Y'all let me know if my headphones start to cut out and I'll just take them off. You're good. You sound loud and okay. clear to me right now. Perfect. Yes, ma'am. Hey family, thank you for tuning in. We will get started yeah. shortly. Technical difficulties. Um, yes, <laughs> that always kind of happens with this. You know, we're figuring it out. Are you both um, in DC right now? We're, we're gonna. No, I'm in New York. You're in New York, okay. I'm in New York as well. Okay. Very but cool. I'll I'll be back in DC soon. We feel like it's our second home. You on the West Coast? I'm in LA, but I'll be in DC this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> DC is in fact a second home. All right. Well, why don't we get the conversation started and we'll keep an eye out for Christine. Um but I just want to welcome everyone and and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are talking about Reclaim Your Vote on this episode of Justice Now, and I am uh, the host of this show. I'm Jerrica Richardson. I'm the Senior Vice President for Equitable Justice and Strategic Initiatives at the National Urban League, and I am joined by two dynamic individuals, and hopefully a third will be joining us soon, um, Ms. Tiffany D. Lofton, who is a national organizer, um, on civil rights, social justice, um, just a badass in every way, shape or form. And we're really stoked to have you on to talk about all things voting rights today. I'm and I'm to also here. joined, <laughs> good to have you. And I'm also joined by uh, my colleague, Alex Rias, who uh, is definitely um, our go-to guy when we are talking about voting rights and policy and advocacy. Alex is Senior Director for Equitable Justice at the National Urban League, and this is his issue. Um, he lives and breathes voting rights, so I'm so glad to have you both on today. And for those, of, uh, for those folks who are not familiar with Reclaim Your Vote, it was an initiative started by National Urban League and BET. Um, looks like we have Christine coming in. Okay. I'm accepting it. Let's see. Um, it was started. Okay. There, there she is. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> Success with technology. <laughs> Christine, thank you so much uh, for joining us. 
uh, we were just getting started um, and I uh, introduced uh, Tiffany and Alex, both who have just been doing amazing work in voting rights. And I would love to introduce you to our audience. Uh, we have Christine Chen, who is the co-founder and executive director of AP APIA Vote. And you all have been doing incredible work in organizing and focusing on voting rights for the Asian and Pacific Islander American community. And just would love to hear your take uh, today. Um, we talked about Reclaim Your Vote uh, that the National Urban League has uh, partnered with on BET last year and how we are doubling down on those efforts this year. Uh, not only are we uh, partnering and lifting up National Black Voter Registration Day, which is this Friday, the 17th, which Tiffany has been working super hard on, and we'll hear more about that from her. Uh, but we've also been partnering and uh, served on the steering committee, Alex, and, and you, Christine, for National Voter Registration Day, which is September 28th. So needless to say, there's a lot going on on voting. And um, I want us to really dive right in and talk about on the ground work. A few weeks back, we talked about, uh, we had a great panel discussion and we talked about um, the August 28th March on, um, uh, March on Washington for voting rights. And we talked about all the calls of action that are done and that have been lifted up on the federal level. But we recognize that all politics is local and that what is happening on the ground is critically important. So we really wanna focus on all the great organizing that you all have done. Um, so I just wanna jump in and Tiffany, if it's okay if I start with you. Sure. Um, and, and for all of you, please feel free, this is a conversation. And so if you wanna piggyback off of something that uh, one of your colleagues have said, let's do it. Um, so Tiffany, you've been doing a lot of organizing uh, for so many amazing organizations. You also worked with the NAACP and really led their effort with young people around voting. So my big question is to you, how do we keep folks engaged? Because we've been talking about voting, it seems, year after year after year. And folks showed up and showed out. We saw a record turnout, um, especially in communities of color. Um, but why is it important to keep folks engaged and what are you doing on your end to do that? I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll answer your question this way uh, so that folks can understand because there are folks who are watching who might already be engaged and are looking to get other folks engaged and trying to figure out why it's so difficult. And then there are folks who are not yet engaged. So I, I wanna answer the question this way. Um, elections and politics just in general influence change improve or uh, ruin frankly our daily experiences in our communities what we've been seeing happening across the country not only with covid schools are now going back into session in person uh who our district attorneys are i'm working on a case right now uh, in clean texas i'll be there on the 25th for a rally for a black man who's been in jail for seven years without trial the district attorney is now trying to move them to execution without having a trial. And so the district attorney is an elected position. These simple things that we talk about, whether it's the Texas ban on women's rights or whether it is um, canceling student loan debt, voting rights in the John Lewis bill that's been passed uh, in half the body of Congress, not the other half. We are having conversations every day about the things that our communities need and the way that we get those done usually happens because somebody's making a decision or because people get to make the decision. Even today, right now, on September 14th, in California, there is a vote happening right now to recall the governor of the state. And folks think, because of mismessaging, that the election is, has something to do with COVID, that the numbers didn't get counted right, or we gotta worry about who the governor is because uh, the election didn't work right. And it's actually a fight over immigration. It's a fight over sanctuary states and sanctuary cities. It is a fight about politics and power. Every single thing that we do uh, uh, is somehow unraveled in this game, because it is a game, of politics to me. When people uh, ask the question, how do we keep folks engaged? It is not, and we have learned this, not only as people of color, <laughs> but as young folks. It is not by forcing people to vote. It is not by tricking people into voting. It is, it's not even by shaming people into voting. 
I say all the time, the way that we're going to keep folks involved and, and we keep them involved by making them leaders is if they understand clearly how their choices impact their daily life. If, if they understand how going to the ballot will make a difference in their community. And when we're able to personalize politics in that way, then we don't have to work really hard to get people to take action. They're going to take action because they realize what's at stake for them. Um, and so that is the way that we do that. For folks who are trying to recruit other people, we, we are trying to, dra I'm trying to drag my parents right now. I'm like, yo, did y'all get your ballot? You got to turn them in. Today's the election day for Governor Recall, et cetera. And they're like, yeah, but why are you forcing me to do something that's so transactional, right? We have to turn transactional actions into transformative movements. And if I tell my parents, yo, like what's happening right now with homelessness, which is skyrocketing in Los Angeles, and we talk about kids going back to school, the vaccine, COVID safety, et cetera, all of those things in California, the governor will have an influence over. So if you make the right decision today, that could impact our future for tomorrow. Then they're like, oh, well, let me make sure the right person stays in office, and the wrong person doesn't stay in office, whatever it might be. And if we can make politics more personal in that way, by not dragging folks to the ballot, I think we'll be a lot more successful in our movement. I love that. And you um, know, we're at a I think we're at a really good position um, just from our experience in 2020. Like people really made the connection that elected officials who they maybe potentially had ignored in the past really are making those day-to-day -day decisions. And that's transitioning over to 2021 because this pandemic has not um, stopped. Um, right. But it really goes back to, I think, one, one's own network. And especially during a pandemic when we're not necessarily widely engaged in the general public, we really have to rely on our individual networks and relationships to really have those thoughtful conversations, especially right now when politics is, st is still seen as very divisive. And so it's when we could try to have those conversations within our own family and friends. I think they're also the most effective as we've seen in the past to get folks out to the polls and help them really make the connection um, and connect the dots. Christine, can I just follow up on that? Are there any lessons learned that you think it's important for communities of color to remember when we just look at our most recent past elections? Because we saw not only record turnout, but we saw great numbers in diversity and representation in a way that we haven't seen in quite some time. You know, I think uh, 2020 was just amazing. Between the census and the elections, we saw that really this community is becoming more and more diverse, but it's also this younger generation that's um, at home with their elders and they're having those thoughtful conversations. I think um, the, the experience that the Asian community um, experienced in the last 18 months with the rise of anti-Asian violence and sentiment, mm -hmm. uh, coupled with uh, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, um, I think it's really the younger generation that brought those conversations to the home to actually have those thoughtful, difficult conversations sometimes. But now we're actually understanding how, uh, what is really the, the backbone behind of all this is happening. And I think the coalitions are, are tighter and are more real um, between individuals and families. Um, I, I think that's one lesson that was learned, but then also um, for the fact that voting increase last cycle was also due, due to the fact that more states widely allowed early voting and mail-in ballots, which we've seen on the West Coast for California, Oregon, and Washington, who readily had that um, accessibility. When you actually allowed that in all the other states, you know, we see the increase of all the communities in terms of their participation rate. Now, I'm just afraid that with the voter suppression laws, if we don't um, do something, then they're going to take that away. And that's going to be another hurdle once again for our uh, base of voters. Um, you've lifted up a great point. So let's talk about that. Alex, these voter suppression bills are sweeping the nation. And you turn on the TV and you hear uh, a whole host of things. You hear about folks not being able uh, to give out water, um, but it gets more drastic and dramatic than that. Do you mind breaking it down for our viewers about what some of these laws are and how they're actually impacting our ability uh, to have a record turnout again? Absolutely. I want to key in on something that Tiffany lifted up, and that is personalizing politics. There's something really 
uh, personal about the power of the vote and making the mechanism through which we exercise that power must be personal. And to lift up uh, something that Christine said is that because of the pandemic, states had to make ballot access easier. That means that it, it became part of the lifestyle. Voting has to be a lifestyle, uh, an easy lifestyle decision that we make. That's why uh, states that allow for automatic delivery of a ballot to your home so that you know that it will be in your mailbox at the time that it needs to be there, that is important because it fits into your lifestyle so that you can exercise your vote. What we're seeing now across the country, over 400 pieces of legislation have been introduced in the 2021 uh, uh, legislative cycle alone in direct uh, response and retaliation for us utilizing our power to vote and exercising that lifestyle choice of voting. The barriers were, re were lowered so that ballot access was easier. And now the direct response, the direct response is to lift those barriers once again. To also highlight something that's already been discussed, voter turnout went up astronomically and historically because of the 2020 election. That is a signal that barriers to ballot access should not exist. The point of this democracy is to welcome folks to vote. If you're eligible, eligible to vote, you should be able to vote. Why are there jurisdictions that would rather lift those barriers than reduce them? We saw increases, dramatic increases across every demographic of voter. And we know, particularly in, in communities of color, that not only age, but household income and education attainment all uh, can be predictors of whether or not we will be able to vote. Why? Because if we have multiple jobs to work, multiple family members to take care of, and, and, and uh, mul multiple places to be, if we have transportation access issues, we don't have a car, we don't live in a, uh, a, an area that is readily accessible by public transportation, all of those barriers um, play and overlap and overlay with having reduced uh, access to uh, ballot drop-off locations or having our poll sites changed um, you know, haphazardly or without our notice. These are the sort of insidious uh, changes to the law that happen under people's noses because it happens outside of the lifestyle choice that is mm. voting. Mm -hmm. these, voter, these restrictive voting laws are trying their hardest to ensure that politics remains impersonal that you have to have privilege in order to get to the ballot. We have to remind folks that voting is a right. And just like any other right, they should be offered, not begged for, and we shouldn't have to fight. But you know what, and I can speak for the folks that are on this panel, we're willing to fight, that's why we're here. Well, I'm glad that all of you are willing to fight because it is a huge, hurdle that is in front of us right now. And I just really want to focus on how we bring folks together. You know, Tiffany, we talk about folks organizing locally, um, but you've been doing it nationally. You're all based on the West Coast, but I feel like every time I look at my phone or turn on the TV, you're somewhere in the East Coast, you're in the South. So can you talk a little bit about how you build these national coalitions uh, around issues that matter? Um, you've been involved in Good Trouble uh, with a whole host of um, the Freedom Rides and rallies. How do you connect the dots and bring people together on issues that we know we all care about, but to motivate them to actually take action? Thank you for that question. So I, you know, now that I have not had a chance yet this summer to like think about all the work that I've been doing. So I'm gonna be honest with you, that made me a little emotional because hearing you talk about what you've been seeing me do, like uh, for affirming me, thank you for that. Um, I'm a process that when I get off the live. So, <laughs> so uh, everybody here knows, or, or most folks should know that I transitioned out of the NAACP back in February. Um, but I was there for a little over three years organizing young people across the country um, during the pandemic, but also prior to that, 
around issue-based organizing. I believed that young folks are often uh, treated as kids and <laughs> told to do programmatic things like bake sales and fundraising or whatever, but they're not asked to actually like put people in positions where they're a able to make decisions and lead and organize campaigns and demand the world that they think this world, what they think this world should look like. Um, and so it's simple for me. I, I think that you have to have strong organization. You have to have a strong organization that believes in its people. And you have to have people who are directly impacted by the issues. Those three things are what you have to have if you're going to have a successful campaign. Um, the opportunities that I've been afforded, I, I took a little bit of a hiatus because of some health stuff. But when I came back, I worked with Planned Parenthood, uh, organizing about 700 young students of color around the country who were in school organizing on women's reproductive issues in their own local city. So like one city might work on having, you know, access to feminine pro products in their bathrooms. One might work on women's choice. One might work on free condoms, uh, sex education, whatever it was. And it was these young leaders who had these incredible ideas. And I was like, I have to help train them for how to choose this issue, turn this issue into a campaign and then win this issue. And while they're doing that, build other strong leaders around them. And then I got asked to work with the Black Voters Matter of Freedom Rights bus tour that you mentioned earlier. Uh, we did 10 different cities, excuse me, nine, 10 different cities, nine days. It was nonstop. I've never been on a bus that long in my entire life. It was so much fun and I was exhausted, but we got to DC and we were advocating in all these cities, uh, working towards building momentum and people power for the John Lewis Restoration Rights Act. And uh, our job was to talk to community people on the ground. It wasn't to have a parade or have a show or bring celebrities in to come and talk about it on their platforms. It was us talking directly to people on the ground who were a part of their church, members of their organizations, uh, teachers, uh, faith leaders, young people, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, and bring them together for conversation and dialogue to say, Here, what are the issues that are happening in your city? And do you know what's happening in DC while you're not paying attention they're trying to pass this legislation and we need your help to move it, right? And, and doing that in the 10 different cities and getting back to DC to do a rally there and push the legislation, you know, a couple months later, here we are and it's halfway through Congress. Um, it takes people power for us to be able to do that and we're leaning on the leaders. Alex is one of our leaders who came and spoke at our rally in DC for us to uh, uh, elevate not just a national platform, but to also give people a sense of their own agency. A lot of this work to your question about building successful coalitions is not just the leadership, but it's like, if I can make sure that young people or people in general in their cities feel like they have power to make a difference, then I don't, then my job is almost insignificant because if, if you feel like you have the power in your city to change what you need to change, you're not gonna need me to help you, right? You're gonna get the change that you want. I want folks who are in Louisville, Kentucky to pick their own mayor. There's a, there's a mayor's race happening in Louisville, Kentucky right now. Those folks are still waiting on justice for Breonna Taylor and for the police officers to get arrested. We went, uh, I was with, until Freedom organizing with them last summer, and we went into the city, worked with organizations that already existed, helped them recruit more organizations, helped them fundraise money, put some strategy to some of the work that they were doing, and now they're running their own campaigns in the city, right? As the leadership of Until Freedom has created moved them. So to your question about how do we build strong coalitions, you need those three things. Strong organization, which is why I tell everybody all the time, you have to be a part of a political home. Alex and I were just on an interview the other day, BET talking about this. You have to have a political home. You have to have strong leadership that's able to move, foster, create community, uh, understand the different levels of leadership, and also build leaders that are able to pass on the baton. That's a different life for a different day. And then third, work on those issues so that you can be successful in changing your community. And if you can, if you can center people around those tactics, and you bring folks together, the people who want to be a, a part of that coalition, I call it the coalition of the willing, those are the folks who are supposed to be there. So that Good Trouble rally you saw in DC, we had over 130 partners. Why? Because they all believed in the mission. They wanted to get it done together. And if we can stay focused on that <laughs> and put egos aside and not worry about whether or not we're gonna get whether or not we'll get reparations at the end of December, or whether we'll get it in 2025, or whether we can cancel student loan debt for some people and not for everybody. If we can put those differences to the side and say, look, our agenda is the same, because it usually is, we can be successful at a lot of stuff that we've been trying to accomplish over the last couple of years. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that you, or the words that just jumped out to me was power when you were talking. And I think it's important for us to reinforce that voting and being involved in this process is power. Christine, I would love to hear from you uh, about your experience in this space um, and also your vote, your work around National Voter Registration Day. 
what are you doing to get the message out and make clear for folks that, you know, this really is not optional. If we want to be able to determine our own lives and focus on the issues and see the, see the changes that we want to see in our community, can you tell me how you convince folks and how you really educate them on the power of the vote? Right. You know, I, I need to go back to what we had to do to get ready for the 2020 cycle, you know, because in 2019, a number of us were on the road for like from June to February of 2020, every single week um, doing trainings, not only about the preparing for the primaries and general elections, but also the U.S. Census. So that also gave us an opportunity to engage other community organizations that typically were not uh, politically engaged with the voting aspect, but they felt like, oh, okay, with census, they understand about representation. Um, they understand uh, being counted in that way. So we're able to get them involved with that. But that was like the first step. And then I think when the pandemic hit, we were able to pivot and get them to understand that the work that they, they did around census, they really need to continue that with the elections. And I think um, at that particular point in time, uh, for a lot of the general public, they may not have realized that the rise of anti-Asian violence was actually already happening and people were feeling that. We were using our own infrastructure and our um, trusted messengers within our community that was working on census to now do uh, wellness checks, to um, mm. also check on for those that were dealing with um, anti-Asian hate, how could we protect them or give them the resources um, during this time period. Um, and then and then to also, once again, like, as we talked about, connect the dots in terms of what they were experiencing, how's that related to um, the power of their vote. Um, and then I think what was also beautiful to see is that um, a lot of our organizations in the last 10 years um, at the local level have been working in broad based coalitions. So like in Georgia, you know, the Asian American electorate, they overperformed, not only in the general election, but also in the runoff. And I think that surprised a lot of people. But that was also a collective effort uh, between the Black vote, the Asian vote, the immigrant vote, um, that really led that way. And we, we're seeing those type of collaborations across the country. Um, and it also does tie back into what was said about issues. Um, people are not motivated just because you're a Dem or a Republican. It's really about the issues, the solutions, who's going to take the time to have that longstanding relationship that it can't just be, you know, two months ahead of the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, but how are we going to work together moving forward? I, and I think that also goes back to the issue of redistricting now. Right. And I think um, more of the of these communities are I know it's certainly in my community. they now have an interest in redistricting. That was never the case. I think in the 10 years ago, it was mostly like, oh, that's a New York thing, or that's a California thing. But now that we know that the, um, the community has continued to grow in all the states, we, we've been growing in double digits um, for all 49 states, except for Hawaii, which we're already a majority. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so we're recognizing like, you know what, it's really about uh, developing communities of interest and how can we work with others? Uh, and I think between all of our numbers that we could actually go ahead and be, um, really set us up for the next 10 years. Right. I love that communities of interest, right? When we're talking about these issues, it's broader than just the vote itself. It's about investment in our communities, investment in the things that we care about. Uh, and that's ultimately what makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Alex, earlier in uh, the conversation, I saw a note uh, from one of the folks that are, were tuning in and they asked about accountability. Mm -hmm. And I know we're talking about registering people to vote uh, and encouraging folks to vote, but what happens when we get folks to show up and they um, participate and then they are unfortunately disappointed by those that they elect. Uh, and then some folks I think unfortunately it makes them just remove themselves from the process because it didn't have the added outcome. Can you speak a little bit about accountability? And when we talk about accountability, accountability with elected officials that we put in place. 
Absolutely. Uh, that's a great question, and I, I think it's, a, it's an important one. Um, where I want to start is uh, by highlighting the importance, again, of adopting voting and your exercise of the vote as a lifestyle, right? In your family, if somebody's not treating you well, what do you do? You hold them accountable. In your friend circle, if someone's not treating you well, what do you do? You hold them accountable. In relationships, it's the same thing. This country is no different. You are here, you live here, you work here, and you vote here. These elected officials come and go, but you remain as a voter. You will be here walking up and down the street, going to and from work, to and from school. And if your street or your, your street's not paved, your garbage is not picked up, your bridges and tunnels are flooding like in New York, if that's happening on a continuous basis, the answer is not to stop voting, it's to continue to vote. I want to highlight uh, some of the key words that I heard both Tiffany and Christine mention. One is around messaging. Messaging comes from, you accept messaging from folks who you trust. Folks who you trust get empowered and emboldened to take the, the leap uh, into activism or into organizing because somebody trusted them. That comes goes back to one of uh, the key points that Tiffany was uh, speaking about, about passing the baton, living in a way that's congruent with the messages that you, that you put forward, and also bringing folks under the wing so that when your time to move on has come, you've got a bevy of folks who are ready, willing, and able to take on the mantle, not just of being the mouthpiece of these organizations or these groups, it's also to do the hard work of training folks to understand how this stuff works, right? That's what holding folks accountable is. And sometimes we think about elections as big national, statewide, citywide things, but these things are neighborhood issues. And I think that that is one of the key lessons that I took from this 2020 election. I've been doing this work now for over 15 years in state and city politics and seeing this nationally, seeing this nationally, what people knew was that we're in quarantine. We might not be able to really get that far. And so I want to make sure that the folks who are near me have access to what they need. It's access to the ballot, but it's also, do you have food? Do you have the care that you need? Are you seeing anybody or speaking with anybody? That sort of collective uh, effort is what got us to the polls, in addition to lowering the barriers to the ballot. It's that collective vision that we all need to show up and show out because our neighborhood and our safety and our, our access all uh, rely on that. That's really great. I think when you were lifting that up and talking about the importance of credible messengers, but also support, uh, it just made me think of an actual, an old IG Live that I saw Tiffany do a while back. And you talked, Tiffany, about um, being surrounded by elders in the movement that have been doing the work and how mm -hmm. they've poured into you. I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that because I think we can often get in a space where people look at things from just a generation or perspective and don't see the continuity and the connection between everyone involved from those that did it in the 60s and are continuing to do it and new folks that are joining the fold each day. Yeah, uh, ironically, that's a great question that you asked me. Um, I don't know which live that was, that was, but I know I've spoken about that a bunch of times. <laughs> also, uh, SNCC, uh, I'm gonna take a second to do it now before I forget. The Student Nonviolent Action Coordinating Committee um, that was around in the civil rights movement that was created to fight for uh, uh, voting rights for folks in the South. They were one of the organizations that helped mobilize voters and bring volunteers from around the rest of the country, the nation, to come down to um, uh, Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and some other places to organize black voters and to help them get registered to vote. Um, they are having their 60th anniversary last year, so this is their 61st anniversary. Because of the pandemic, the conference was canceled. Uh, or excuse me, postponed, and now it is happening next year. I believe it's in April. I hope I'm not getting that wrong. 
But you can go to six, uh, SNCC 60th on Instagram, and you can register for the conference there. What folks think, uh, ironically, what folks think uh, about the civil rights movement is that a lot of those leaders are now no, no longer with us, which is very false. <laughs> Most of them are actually still here. Uh, I had the blessing uh, through my uncle, I call him Uncle Roland Martin, Roland Martin, um, who does Roland Martin Unfiltered. He uh, invited me to do an intergenerational conversation in Jackson, Mississippi earlier this year. Actually, it might have been like February, I think. Um, and he partnered young activists and organizers around the country with national uh, uh, elders. I got to meet and speak to Dr. Janetta Cole, who's not only the first female president of Spelman College, but also just like a divine, intelligent, regal Black woman who has done a lot of incredible work in the civil rights movement, uh, has worked for uh, the government and moved legislation that like a lot of us don't acknowledge her for. And in this intergenerational conversation, I got to ask her, like, what is it that you hope young people will walk away with from our discussion in this conversation? And all she did was like praise young people for our boldness, for our bravery, for our risk taking, for our commitment to this work. Um, and that we continue to honor our elders in the process. Uh, when I did the bus tour for the Freedom Rides, we stopped in every city and met with original freedom fighters from that local city. And so, you know, we hear about John Lewis, we hear about Corlin Cox, we hear about Martin Luther King, we hear about, you know, Diane Nash and et cetera. But we don't hear some of the local names. Like who were the bus riders that came from Louisiana, from New Orleans? And who were the bus riders that came from uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and who were the bus riders that came from South Carolina? And I got to meet with some of them and I asked them the same question. And they said, you know, it's gonna be hard for y'all to remember our names, but don't remember this, don't forget the sacrifice. And I just think that that part is really important for us to consider as I am 32 years old and I'm also an Aries. So there are times where you can tell me nothing because I feel like I know everything. I know that's how I am. Uh, but when I get to sit at the feet of uh, Bob Moses, rest in peace. And when I get to sit at the feet of Cortland Cox and Jennifer Lewis, and when I get to sit at the feet of uh, uh, Diane Nash or uh, even Cornel West, who I just got finished speaking to not too long ago, I, I sit down and listen to our elders and I, I thank them for the work that they do. And uh, there's so much that I learned from them directly that I never learned when I was in school. I, I'm born and raised in LA. I went to LAUSD. They never told me who John Lewis was. I didn't know who John Lewis was until I moved to DC in 2011. And I found out he was an elected official. And then I read his autobiography, Walking with the Wind, which is a phenomenal book. And um, that's how I started to learn more about the civil rights movement. So our education is in, is in our own hands and our own power. And a lot of it, because of our culture as black folks, comes from oral history. And if we don't sit at the feet of our elders and listen to them, then we're going to miss an opportunity to not only not repeat the past, but also to get to the future quicker in which our elders want us to. So um, we definitely got to work together. I did a lot of that at the NAACP and I'm still doing a lot of it now, bridging that gap. Oh wait, you're muted. I can't hear you. Can't hear you. Sorry about that. Okay. Sirens in here in New York. <laughs> but um, you said so many things that sparked a lot of ideas for me, but I, I definitely have to, again, shout out John Lewis, as you did, because he really was my introduction to this work. It was, he was the first elected official that I worked for, and it was working for him after I had, in fact, been disenfranchised myself at age 18 in college, at Spelman College, so shout out to Janetta Cole, as well, and, and going through that experience and then having the opportunity to work on these issues with such an icon and such a incredible man who is committed to the mission. So, you know, storytelling is critically important. It's how we share information, but it's also how we make it real for people. Um, and recognizing how important it is to make it real for people, but also how important it is to educate people. Um, we, our time is coming to a close. But I, I definitely want to kick it over to you, Christine, because the 28th is up, upon us. And Tiffany, I'm going to come back to you about the 17th. But the 28th is up, upon us, National Voter Registration Day. Um, what are you doing to amplify the work from your end? What should folks be looking out for? Um, and, and really just tell us about this movement uh, and what we should expect in September. I mean, voting rights, voting rights, voting rights. It's all we've been hearing all summer. Uh, and now we all have a, an opportunity to engage at the same time that folks are talking about Freedom to Vote Act, 
now we have some new legislation. Uh, it seems like the saga continues. Christine, what, um, what can you share with our viewers about National Voter Registration Day? Well, first of all, encourage everyone to follow National Voter Registration Day. And um, so that way you can get up to date information. But you know, it, this really is a national holiday that we celebrate every single year. Um, as you know, this really needs to be part of our yearly routine. Um, this is also the opportunity where we're challenging everyone. Um, can you go ahead and identify someone that just turned 18 or someone that just moved, right? Um, there are also new voters, other new voters out there that um, we have to not just wait until next year. It's actually better to register now and make sure you're properly registered and everything is, is all set so that way you're ready to vote in the 2022 elections. But we also have statewide elections in New Jersey and Virginia, and then also local school boards, city council. Everyone's thinking about California recall um, today, but also the primaries for um, Boston's mayor mayoral race is actually happening today. Right now. Well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's there, once again, it's really having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, connecting the dots about what is weighing on everyone's minds and connecting that to the elections and getting them to register and take advantage of National Voter Registration Day. And, and as I said, it, really, it could be something small or bigger. You know, we have people just are, are having conversations or posting on their social media. Others are having caravans. You know, that, that was really big during the pandemic in 2020, just to uplift it, uh, get people's attention once again. So it really is about just making that effort and, and celebrating this holiday as you would any other holiday. Love that. Um, Alex, any last words? Um, I want to do rapid fire and kind of get, you know, give you each a minute just to uh, share any um, knowledge that you want or any information with folks um, or just some parting words. I'm really excited that we had this conversation and I learned a lot in it and uh, just appreciate all of you and your time. Absolutely. I, I just want to one, lift up and amplify National Black Voter Registration Day this Friday, uh, September 17th, National Voter Registration Day, uh, September 28th. These holidays are part of personalizing politics. That's what this is. It's part of making this a lifestyle, right? Something uh, that is special about our advocacy and our work is that uh, we are the messengers who try to boil down these difficult uh, issues and bring them to folks to make them real. Um, this is an intergenerational, intersectional movement. And the benefit of having an intergenerational, intersectional movement is that we have several messengers across timelines, across uh, space, across uh, you know, different um, cultural backgrounds and language, the language that we use and having language access to the power of the vote, the words that we use, the languages that we uh, build into this lifestyle are so, so, so important. I wanna highlight some stats from last year is that the uh, AAPI community had the largest increase in, uh, in voter turnout. That is proof positive that coalescing with community has a positive effect. And Christine gave the black community a lot of shout out for being intersectional in how it collaborates in our movement collaborates with their movement because the black vote increased to some of its highest levels in over 10 years, right? So these are movements that depend on one another. We live next to one another in lots of places in, in city centers. Uh, we might as well take that walk up to the, uh, the poll together or pick up our, uh, our ballots, um, you know, to mail them in uh, together. We might as well, uh, because this is a lifestyle uh, that we deserve uh, so that every year we know what we bargained for. We don't have to be surprised every year. We should know. And I want to highlight one thing. Uh, we do have some new legislation uh, that does seem to highlight one of the key aspects of uh, making this a lifestyle, and that is establishing an election day as a national holiday. That is something that needs to happen. 
because we shouldn't have to choose between work or voting. We shouldn't have to choose between whether we're going to get our kids to school or whether we're going to vote. These are difficult choices that folks have to deal with every day that show that some folks believe that voting is a privilege that you need to fight for every day instead of a right that you deserve every day. So that's what we need to remember in this fight. And that's what I think I will uh, leave you with. And that is why it's important to celebrate these voting registration holidays. We should be doing it every day in between, but these holidays bring them up to the fore so that folks understand uh, why we're doing this and, and that we're continuing to do this. We're not stopping. So, Tiffany? Uh, Chris, do you mind if I add to your list the liberation agendas? Can we? I, I love ending <laughs> like this because I, I want folks to, to, uh, to imagine how incredible it might be to have Election Day be a holiday, right? Like we're talking about all these significant days that we've created. National Voter Registration Day, Black Voter Registration Day, Black Voter Day, Early Vote Day. We have all these days, but we've had to brand them so that people can make quick associations and they can uh, navigate the process easier. It's so hard to know, well, which state can I register online and which state can I not register online? Well, if, I move, if I'm a student and I move to this state, where can I vote? In some states, you gotta bring your old information from the old state into the new state before you're able to vote and you're not able to have the ID. It's so confusing. You might have to pay money to get an actual card so that you can get an ID so that you can vote. Some of our campuses have shut down uh, precincts and polling sites on campus because of COVID. So now where are our students going to go vote, right? Like there's so many changing factors in elections all the time. And so when we create a liberation agenda pieces, like what Chris, what, uh, what Alex just did, I'm like, yep, let's make voter registration day uh, a, a holiday. Everybody register on this day. You get time off from work. It doesn't count as your vacation time. You still get paid. There's free parking on that day everywhere that you want to go. I think that we should naturalize voter registration. I still don't understand why for the life of me, and nobody's been able to argue with me why, we have to register every single time. I don't understand that. Just like I have a driver's license and every couple of years it expires, your voter registration status should be the same. I also believe that online voter registration should be in every single state. And right now, if I'm not mistaken, there are only 13 states out of the 50 that allow online voter registration. Why I can't go online and register, I do not know why, but I can pay the IRS my taxes on the website with my, with my social security <laughs> number, but I can't register to vote online, I don't understand. So, there, so I wanted to add to the liberation agenda that Chris just made. I'm gonna close up by saying this. Um, uh, the uh, Black Voter Day that's coming up, I am currently working with Vote.org uh, in Virginia specifically, because there's elections happening in Virginia this year, uh, with the HBCUs, there's five HBCUs I'll be working with. So if you are in Virginia at an HBCU, I need you to send me a DM right now because I'm hosting trainings for uh, electoral organizing at five HBCUs in Virginia next month. Uh, and we're organizing those folks to vote, uh, register voters on campus, uh, support them with tools and swag and, and education, et cetera. And then we're gonna turn people out to the elections and create programming around it. So again, if you're in Virginia and you go to HBCU, please, please, please send me a DM um, so I can invite you to the training. Two, uh, vote.org. Uh, I wanna make sure that I sell that as a tool because it's so easy. There is not one website that you can go to to say, I need to look up all the bills in the world. I need to look up all the candidates in the world. I wanna find out how I can read about all the candidates. You'll get that in your voter guide. Uh, but there, there, should, there should be a clear enough reason for people to understand why elections aren't that easy. Because if we had all the information that we needed, the world might look a little different. So vote.org is a really incredible nonprofit organization that does three things for you. If you go to vote.org, you can register to vote. You can check your voter registration status, which you have to do often because you might have gotten purged for the voting. You might have a different location where you vote. I was organizing in Louisville, Kentucky last summer, and people were showing up to a precinct that moved their names to a different location because of their zip code. And it was like almost closing time for the precinct. So they had to drive 30 more minutes to a different office so that they could vote. But if you check your status, you'll be prepared. And like Alex is always saying, you'll have a plan when you go to the ballot box. Uh, and the third thing you can do on the website, you can also fill out the census. So there's four things. You can fill out the census. Um, and you can also get your voter guide. Vote.org will set up automatic text message reminders, email reminders, and you'll get all the information you need so that you can have your nonpartisan information about your elections. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is, please, 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 if you are here and you have not done it yet, join an organization. Join the National Urban League. Join the NAACP. Join your church, social justice ministry. Join your uh, uh, your collegiate 
a sorority and fraternity organization on campus and push them to have an electoral agenda, join your student government, whatever body you can belong to, I think is so important because of what Christina and Alex have said previously about proximity to this work. We need to build community and it doesn't mean what zip code or street you live on. It means who are you in relationship with as we lead this country into the new direction that it's gonna go in. We have midterm elections next year. We got a presidential after that. And it's a lot of foolishness coming down the road. And if we're going to do this, we have uh, successfully, we have to be able to work together. So please join an organization. Thank you for that. Christine, final word is yours. You know, I, you know, there's so much that was, was really well said. The only thing I would add to is the fact that as you're having conversations and checking in with your family and friends and natural things come up in terms of what's on top of their minds, you know, do what you can in a organic way of really connecting it back to the elections, but then also the fact that um, the, what we know in terms of our right to vote is really at stake. I don't think enough people are making that connection right now. And so it's almost like the environment. It's just like, you know, now we're, we're feeling the effects of us neglecting the environment. Well, if we neglect and um, stop paying attention in terms of what is being done to dismantle voting and our access to the ballot box, we're going to be in big trouble. So it's really up to you for all of us to actually make those connections for our family and friends. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, one thing that I just have to say before we leave is that we, how important it is to think about voting as a right and not just a privilege. And what's happening, what we see across the country is making it more of a privilege. And we have to do what we can to make sure it is accessible to every single one. Um, and it's important that we also remember that this is a civil rights, it's a justice issue. I'm looking at Tiffany's shirt, arrest the cops who killed Breonna Taylor. Like this is real folks, we have to see that Voting isn't just something that we are doing out of routine. It's important to make it routine, but there are people that are impacted behind it. And so that is our power. That's the power that every single one of us, uh, every single American citizen has. And we need to do what we can with that power and what we have. So if you're frustrated about what's happening in your community with COVID, or the lack of response or resources. If you're frustrated about what's happening around policing and feeling like you turn on the TV every single day and you see another person of color slain, if you care about those things, as well as a whole host of other issues, this is your opportunity. So yes, register, but then make sure you actually show up and vote and do it time and time again. It's social justice. That's the reason we call the show Justice Now. So I encourage you all to reclaim your vote. Um, look up a lot of the amazing resources that we heard from our amazing leaders this evening and just do what you can and get involved. We all have a role to play. Um, and so with that, I thank you for joining us and hope you tune in two weeks from now. What an incredible conversation. Thank you all. Uh, Christine, Alex, and Tiffany, it has been a pleasure. Uh, and remember, the time for justice is always now. Thank you and have a great night.